desk. Yeah. So can I still see Debbie um, or not? Yep, you should be able to. Okay. Yep, you'll see her right here. In the okay. And I'll make it big. So we're going to leave that one up while then, I give my introduction. Okay, and then to advance it, you can just hit the space bar. Just hit it once and go. Yep. Uh, and how to go go backwards? Um, because we don't we don't want that <laughs> right now. I'll make it go backwards. How did you go backwards? There's if, if you hover over this. Okay, well we won't go backwards. Okay. Would you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Melanie's going to work here and abandoning me with the machine. I'm going to pull it forward. It's not going to mess up anything. All right. And then just yell if you if you need. I'll yell if whatever. Okay. <laughs> All right. Debbie, um, I took this trip with my daughter, Kathy, four years ago in March. And it turned out, I don't know, do you know much about the Southwest and the weather patterns and when the blooms come and all of that or not? No, not really. Um, all right. I've only been out there a couple of times. All right. In general, this is very much in general, in Southern California, on the eastern border near Arizona and the Colorado River, where this state park is, Anza Borrego, um, it's, it only gets on the average five or six inches of rain of a year. So it's definitely desert. And most of that rain will come through, I'm going to say, middle of November to the middle of February. So the flowers start to bloom usually in late February through March into early April <clears throat> before the heavy duty, hot, dry weather sets in. So we went in the middle of March and it just so turned out that that particular year, four years ago, what would that have been? 2018, the winter months before the end of 2017 and early into 2018, they had more rain than usual. So the park service was notifying everybody in the world that this was the best in 12 years for the bloom. So Kathy and I went on a Monday, but there were still hordes of people out there in the desert like we were looking at the flowers. So I'm just gonna give before we move on to our PowerPoint show, uh, a few bits of information about the park the way I always do. Um, it's down in the southeastern corner of California. It's part of the Sonoran Desert, which really rambles down into Sonora, Mexico, where it got its name, and up into Arizona, mostly. Um, but this particular part in southeastern California is given a special subname, and it's known simply as the California Desert. So that's where we're at. Um, off to our east is the Colorado River, which separates Arizona from California. And to the west are the mountains. And just beyond the mountains then is the Pacific Ocean. And I'm gonna take a guess, I didn't measure it on the map, but probably between 150 miles away to the west is the ocean, but between it, are these mountains that go up about 6,000 feet high, which is a little over a mile. And that produces, everybody that has studied earth science, <laughs> a rain shadow on the eastern side. As that moist air from the Pacific Ocean is forced to rise up over those mountains, it cools, holds less moisture, clouds form, it rains or it snows, in a sense, it's like a sponge being squeezed dry. And when it comes down the eastern side, um, it becomes warmer and drier and drier and drier. And so you get very, very little rain on the downwind side. Let's see, as I mentioned before we started, the rainy season, which produces on the average six inches only, 10 inches is the definition of a desert. So six inches, it's a real desert. Um, 
the rains come between November and February, usually. Once in a while, they'll have thunderstorms in the summer, but that's more rare. Um, let me think here. If we look to the west, those 6,000 foot mountains, but if we turn east and start walking towards the Colorado River, we wind up, guess what? 70 feet below sea level, minus 70 feet. And that's of course where the Salton Sea is. Um, so the park runs from um, about 800 feet up to 70 feet below sea level. So you have hmm, not quite a thousand feet difference in elevation from the west to the east. One, and let's see, what's this? Okay, talk about that in a minute. One landform that we're gonna talk about is a Spanish word, bajada, spelled B-A-J-A-D-A. -A -A. In Spanish, the J's are pronounced H in English. And that's simply a talus slope at the foot of the mountains. Anybody that's flown over the west, and you come up to a mountain range in front of you, and then there's a valley at the foot of the mountain range. But at the foot of the mountain is a pile of rubble due to erosion, wind, frost, chemical, roots. As the mountain raises up over the millions of years, the erosion wears it down. And you wind up with rubble from boulder size to sand grain size. And in rainstorms and wind, they tumble down the mountain and they pile up on the foot of the mountain to create what is called a bajada, well-drained, loose, gravelly, sandy soil. And many plants will grow on this type of soil. Something about, okay, what kind of plants grow in the desert? There, there are a few trees. I only have a picture of one. There are several shrubs that are perennials. And then the thing that people come to see are all those beautiful annuals. And they, they're like our, I, I think of the desert annuals like our spring ephemerals in our woods here in the Northeast. They have a short window of opportunity to come up above the ground, make leaves, make flowers, make the seeds so that they can continue to live. And then they die and the seeds are left behind. And this all happens within four to six weeks after the proper amount of winter rains and the, the seeds will germinate if there's enough rain. Sometimes the seeds lie around for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years before the conditions are right. It has to be in the spring. It has to be enough winter rains. And then they have that short span maybe two months at the most to make enough seeds so they will survive for another season. So I, I think that's pretty amazing that over millions of years, the seeds have figured out how to do that. If it didn't rain enough in the winter, they don't germinate because in a sense, <laughs> they know that they won't be able to complete the process. So anyway, that's my introduction and now if I can remember how to do this, we'll start looking at the plants. Ah, da, da. Okay, this is a famous barrel cactus and I have not bothered with the Latin names. Unlike Terry who studied Latin in high school, I never did. And I can't pronounce most Latin words. So I'm sorry guys, we have the common name, not the name that the scientists have created for this species. So there's a barrel cactus. Now, this one, Debbie, is probably only about a foot high and maybe not about 10 inches wide, but they can get with age three, four feet high. But the interesting thing about a barrel cactus, you remember as a Girl Scout, I don't know, were you ever a Girl Scout, Debbie? Yes, okay. Um, you're lost in the North Woods. The moss grows on the north side of the tree. Well, if you're lost in the Southwest desert and there's some barrel cactus around and they're of any age, they all lean to the South. 
So it's like a compass plant and they come in different colors, yellows and oranges and reds. This particular one had yellow flowers and I did a sort of, there it is sitting with plants around it and then a close up of that ring of flowers at the top. And by the way, um, in a desert where water is scarce and cacti, if that's the plural, have learned how to soak it up and expand, that means animals want to chew it up to get the water. So cactus have evolved those amazing spines and thorns and sharp edges to help prevent that. Another, by the way, the, this cactus family only appears in the new world. They're not in Asia, none in Africa, none in Europe. So I can just imagine, especially those, the Spanish and then the English seem to enjoy this, come over here back in the 17, 1800s, the botanists, and they'd scurry around finding oh, this new plant. And, oh my God, that new plant. And they get to the Southwest and was like, oh my God, all these incredible cactus. We've never seen anything like this before. So it's kind of special just for us. Now, this one was about three feet high. It's called the Claret Cup. And in a minute, I'll show you a close up. It's that lovely scarlet orangey with a yellow center, but it looks like a cup that was designed by the wine connoisseurs for claret. Lots of stamen. By the way, I, we saw hardly any birds. Now, I don't know if there were just too many people around. Um, and we did see some bees and some other bugs, but once again, not a lot. So two cacti. Maybe they come out at night. Well, I know the moths do. So, um, and I don't, I'm not much of a bug person as I, you know, general bug person. So I don't really know, except I do know the moths come at night. <coughs> now I really like the Ocotillo, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, it's not a cactus, it's a different genre but we tend to think of it as a cactus because once again, it's spiny. It actually can photosynthesize from its stems, which can get to be 12 feet tall. Um, it's very thorny and it has these wonderful crimson flowers at the top. And sometimes I remember one year, John and I went about, oh, good 15 years ago. They had extraordinary summer monsoon rains in July. And we went up to Joshua Tree, where they also grow. And they were having a second bloom that year because of the extra rain. So they had bloomed in March. And then in August, they were reblooming. Um, I have a great tale. You'll get a kick out of this, Debbie. Okatia. The first time, and I started driving west to visit my kids, um, let me think, 30 years ago. And for 20 years, every summer, I'd drive west. And once I got to Kansas, I'd get off the interstates, and the rest of the trip would be on two-lane back roads. And I had started reading about, you know, the desert plants. And back in those days, I went in March, because that's when my spring break was. And I decided that year, by gosh, I was going to drive through this state park in March. I'm a bit of a road rallier. I, do, I did that trip in three days. So I wasn't going to linger in the park, but I did want to drive through it and stop once or twice on the side of the road and just take a look. Um, a real flyby look at the wildflowers. <laughs> so there I was on an early Saturday morning, sitting on the edge of the road. And there's only one or two roads that go through the park, two lanes, and um, admiring all these cacti and other wildflowers. And all of a sudden I hear this rumble, 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 rumble. And up rolls three Harley Davidsons. And on their back were three Harley guys, all dressed in leather and helmets. And two of them had kids on the back, about eight, nine, 10 years old, a girl and a boy. And I suddenly thought, ah, oh, Saturday morning, mom decided the guys were gonna babysit 
so they could go do whatever women do when they can get rid of the kids for a few hours. But the first guy hopped off and he had this huge tripod with this great big fancy camera on it and a big beard. And as he disappeared off the road down the wash, he hollered behind, come on guys, two days ago, the ocotilla was just about to start blooming and it'll be perfect this morning. So these three Harley guys disappeared down the wash with their kids in tow. And I thought, I love it, breaking the stereotypes. Who would have thought a tough old Harley guy would want to take a picture of a flower, right? So anyway, whenever I see the Ocotilla, I remember those guys. What's next? Oh, uh, this is the one you don't want to, this supposedly is the jumping cactus, the hola. Once again, CH is pronounced hola, I think. Um, that's not true. They, the spines do not leap out off the plant and get you, but all you need to do is just ever so lightly brush against it. And it really evidently is painful, painful. Now let's look down this gravelly. They didn't bring the gravel in. That's what the surface of the desert looks like. They tried to put some rocks along the edge of the path because like the tundra, the desert soil is very, very fragile. And you walk on it and you break up what is called a desert pavement. And then it opens it up to wind erosion in particular. Um, so you try to stay on the paths. And most people, I admit, were pretty good about that. We're looking west here. The park pretty much butts up against those mountains that do rise up to 6,000 feet. We have an Okotia and a few other things, maybe a rabbit bush. And nothing usually grows by itself. Quite often, a shrub will provide shelter for things that can grow that are annuals. So usually things come in clusters. All righty, now I worked with three books that I had. One was, I think, Sonoran Desert Plants. Another was Cacti of the Southwest. And another was an Arizona book. But once again, this is right over the border from Arizona. And there's quite a few plants that they live in both states. So I tried to identify everything. And I tell you, sometimes it was just hard. So let's see, this, we're cutting out here. So I'll read what it says. I figured it was either the golden bush or tax stem or probably gold fields. And it's a low growing annual. And let's see, do I have a close up? I think, yes with a, a paler, um, I think as it get, the blossom gets older, it fades. And so it becomes more of an ivory around the edge. But look at that nice gravelly, quote, soil. If you think you gardeners here in Allegheny County think you have it hard, <laughs> try and grow in that. Um, soils out in the West in deserts tend to have a pH of seven or eight or nine. Forget growing azaleas and blueberries. And it tends to be shallow soil, quite often hard packed, very gravelly, sandy. So these plants have evolved over time to be able to grow in those situations. Here was another mystery. There are not many blue wildflowers in the desert. Many of them are yellow or white. Um, so I don't know how to pronounce it, blue phacelia or maybe Hylia, um, one or the other of those. And it's a small flower, maybe an inch and a half in diameter, bally, spherical, on a shrubby um, plant that grows, once again, for support, lots of things that are more, what? Fragile wind-wise will grow in between the branches of a stronger shrub so they don't get blown over. And here is the desert marigold. And I do have a close up of that. And I'm, I don't think it's the same family as our marigolds, but because it looked like sort of, not really, somebody named it the desert marigold. 
you have any questions, Debbie, just chime in. Oh, there's one of those tourists. <laughs> That's my daughter, Kathy, my eldest. And um, the funny story about Kathy was years ago when I first went out there, um, I said to her, Kathy, oh, this was in San Diego. Kathy, I really want to go over the mountains to the desert. And she just looked at me and said, why would you want to go to the desert? There's nothing there but rocks. So she was not, at a, we never did go. That was years ago. And so four years ago, we had had other plans, all that fell through. And um, partly, but it was a family squabble thing. And so she was feeling a little bit guilty. <laughs> Although they were all to fault, at fault, all the kids. She decided she'd be magnanimous. Is that the word? Mom, you want to go to the desert? And I said, sure, I want to go to the desert. So we went for the day to the desert and um, she had a good time. Wow, it's beautiful. I know it is, it's totally different. The temperature, by the way, it was March, middle of March. Um, I think it did get up to the middle, maybe even upper seventies, but it was sunny of course. And there was just a light breeze. So it, uh, you have to be careful if you're an Easterner or you know, a snow bunnies. Um, you can very easily get sunburnt within a half hour. You're, um, well, not here so much, but if you're at a higher elevation, like you were in New Mexico, um, you need to put on sunscreen or long sleeves and um, floppy hats and sunglasses and all of that. I really loved these. Um, they're only an inch high called Desert Stars. And once again, sitting in that amazing soil, otherwise known as gravel. <laughs> Anyway, I loved them they, uh, and they were carpeted. They were like scattered everywhere, not wall to wall, but probably millions of them. What about their foliage? I don't see any leaves. Well, you know, uh, often it's, it's very teeny tiny leaves, skinny little leaves or almost, um, sometimes the leaves had already dropped and it's just the stems, but you're right. There are not many leaves that show. Of course, I was focusing on the flowers, so I'm pretty sure this was a desert pincushion. Let's see if I have a close up of that. Yes, I do. Once again, low growing, maybe a foot high, often scattered in other shrubs for support, but there's a close up. Tiny little white ball. Okay, the next one is the last one that I, uh oh, what happened? Up, oh, Melanie. <laughs> okay. I don't know, all of a sudden it went to everything. <laughs> okay, that's where I was. And then you could just. Got, right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Boy, don't put me on a spacecraft. Press the wrong button. I'm in trouble. All right. This is the last one that I took in the park, a beaver tail cactus. And there am I with the camera. <laughs> the, what you try and do is, of course, keep the sun, you know, keep your shadow out of the picture. In this case, it wasn't possible. There was a lady over here waiting to take a picture and there was a big rock right behind it. So the only place I could stand to get a picture caught my shadow <laughs> in, in the image. All righty, we spent, we probably got there around 9.30. It was about a two, at least a two, two and a half hour drive. So we left early, got there 9.30 on a Monday morning, probably spent close to three hours wandering around the park all in one area. Um, then Kathy wanted to get, um, okay. It's a huge park that's very irregularly shaped with the mountains to the west and the Colorado River. I think it goes all the way to the Colorado River on the east. Um, but cut out of the park is private property. And there was a small town, mostly a tourist town, I believe, where people come and have rich people come and have winter places to stay called Borrego Springs.
but they had a bookstore and for some reason Kathy wanted to go to the bookstore so I was a little tired by then tromping around for three hours so we there's the main drag through the town I think it actually was four lanes wide maybe and so there's the library and or the bookstore a parking lot and then behind it was an arroyo like a ravine a dry wash no water in it maybe 10 feet wide and a foot deep where in the winter probably some water ran temporary stream and what the bookstore had done was unbeknownst to us until we got there I was going to wait in the car and I saw this sign they had planted a beautiful garden of all these desert plants and then some and they had a little trail so while Kathy went and did her whatever with the books I went and saw more plants that they had planted and I think this is familiar agave now if I, Debbie remind me isn't this the century plant supposedly after 100 years of looking like this it sends up a 20-foot stalk makes a flower makes seeds and gives up the ghost Me, and isn't this yeah. also what they put in tequila i think oh yeah I, I think you're right i think okay this has also been adapted by the um nursery business and i am sure they have done lots of hybrids and especially in the southwest um they wouldn't do so well up here but in the southwest a lot of people plant these in their yard as part of their xeriscape i think it's called where you plant dry plants that you don't have to water since water is scarce and expensive down there in san diego and other cities now i have a great tale if anybody's come up to my garden my rock garden in front of my house they will see the rocky mountain bluebell beautiful little plant uh, gray green leaves pretty blue flowers with white stamens very very pretty um years ago i i bought a packet of seeds when i was out there in march visiting my kids i'd bring home a couple of packets of seeds from the from the west and i would start them indoors about a month before the frost put them out in late may in my garden, good soil, plenty of moisture. They would grow maybe a foot high and have maybe 12 blossoms. And by the 4th of July, they were dead. And I just assumed that's what they do. And then years later, and maybe we'll see it in a month when we go through Joshua Tree. I was in Joshua Tree, also in March, walking in the wash nothing but six inches of gravel and boulders and other plants of that desert and there was a rocky mountain bluebell plant that was three feet tall and probably had hundreds of blossoms on it and it was growing in nothing but gravel so to me i i often lecture when we talk about soil and gardening not all plants love a rich, moist, humusy soil with lots of organic matter. No, some like to grow in nothing but gravel <laughs> and maybe six inches of rain in the winter and then nothing. And um, it was quite splendid. Now, this one wasn't as tall. Um, it was only like a foot tall and it was growing in partial shade. Hey. Yes. Mary Lou, did you go home and switch out your rich humusy soil? Yeah, I don't plant it in the garden anymore. I plant it in my gravelly um, up in front of the house with, where it's mostly just gravel. And so it grows about 18 inches tall. It doesn't like the humid air. You see, that's the trouble with um, if you try to bring a plant from another eco bio system, especially a dry, um, hotter, um, you know, you can start plants indoors and put them out in the summer. You can raise the bed with sand and gravel to give good drainage, but you can't do anything about the humid air. So they don't usually prosper. Okay, I've lost track here. This one has a great name. I love this name, uh, a fairy duster. <laughs> and that's the stamens, those long red, pinkish red 
um, filaments that you see there, the duster. Um, it's like a turkey feather duster. Those are all the male stamens hanging out in the air to help with the pollination. And there you've got leaves in here. But once again, this bush grew up in a, inside of another bush to give it support. Now this sand verbena is quite common throughout the Southwest. And I've seen it many times in March along the roadsides. It's one of those, you know, like, let's see, in spring for us, the colts foot, the yellow before the daffodils grows along the side of the road. And other things like to grow along the edge of the road, uh, Queen Anne's lace, uh, they like a poor soil. So sand verbena, which usually is a lavender color and grows about eight inches foot high maybe, it's an annual, I think it's an annual. Hmm. Don't swear to that, might be a perennial. Um, it's very, very common. Now this was towards the back, the, the bookstore is behind me and to the left. So this is kind of like the back corner. Once again, looking west, you can see the mountains, which are pretty barren. There's nothing, no trees grow on them. This is the east side in the rain shadow, and we see some cirrus clouds. Once again, moisture coming up over the mountains they get pretty dry by they get to the top. And the trees you see there, pale green, are the what I I really like them. If I lived out there, I'd have them in my yard. Palo Verde, um, green bark. And once again, they have yellow flowers in the spring and leaves, but they often drop their leaves late in summer or in the middle of summer, but they can still do photosynthesis on their green bark. Um, this strange columnar um, cactus, I could not find. I don't know what it is, but that magnificent one in the middle um, is a prickly pear. And one year, my friend Cindy came with me um, and she had, let me think, color film in her camera. And she was taking, once again, when I drive west, I drive. I don't dawdle much, but every now and again, she would stop and she'd get a picture. And when we finally got to Arizona on the back rows, the old Route 66, we started seeing some wonderful clumps of prickly pear on the side of the road. And Cindy said, oh, I've got to get a picture of the prickly pear. No, not that one. And so we passed that one. And then there was another clump. No, that that's too far from the road. So this went on for a few miles. And finally she said, all right, all right. Whatever the next one is, I'll, we'll stop and I'll get a picture. <laughs> well, there was no next one. <laughs> it was like we had passed the last one. So in her collection of photos going west that year on the back roads, um, <laughs> no prickly pear. But this is a magnificent one, isn't it? And I actually bought, the natives used to make um, candies, jellied candies out of the flowers. And I actually bought a box once at one of the native um, museums and um, brought it home and all excited. Well, I tell you, it was pretty blah. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd spend my time making prickly pear um, candy. I know they make prickly pear jam and that's pretty yep. good. Yeah, have you tasted it? Oh, okay. It's probably the sugar. <laughs> probably. Well, I made Queen Anne's lace. A guy, um, what's his name? I'm forgetting his name now. He and his wife, and he made Queen Anne's lace jelly. Lovely pale pink color. And he gave me a jar. But once again, it was really blah in taste. Is it from the flower? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and let's see, I've got just a few more here. Um, this is a famous, of course, and I don't know how to pronounce it. Serrero, is it? Cactus? I've tried to figure out how to say it, and my tongue just doesn't want to go around it. But this is the one of the Western movies. You now, John Wayne with this cactus in the background, usually with arms. Well, things in the desert don't grow very fast. Um, Maybe we humans could figure out how to do that and be 50 years old and still look like a teenager. Uh, this one is probably 30 to 40 years old and it was about four feet tall. 
Um, they have to get to be about 40 or even 50 years old before they start making arms. And where they usually start growing is a seed will fall in the middle of a bush. And so for the first 10 years, as they are only, you know, like a half inch, an inch, two inches tall, they're growing up through the bush, which provides some protection from animals eating them when they're very teeny tiny. And of course, you know how this works. They have a massive shallow root system. And whenever it does rain, those roots suck up all the water, which is why you don't have a lot of plants growing around it. And then it's like an accordion and a sponge and it just doubles in diameter or more as it soaks up the water, which it can then live on for months during the dry summer months as it shrinks and dries out. Well, there's Kathy again, standing with, now I have to, okay, the desert palm is what we call an endemic, meaning it only grows in this part of the world, this particular species of palm tree, nowhere else. There's a few um, in Arizona, in the Western part of Arizona, up in canyons usually, because they need a source of water, usually in an oasis. Nine Palms, I think, was this palm tree. So there are not a lot of them, and they don't cover a large area. And within that area, they only grow where the water is close to the surface, which means near a spring or up in a canyon where you have permanent runoff from the mountains. So there it is, and there's my daughter. This is still behind the bookstore. She must have found her book and came looking for me. And then two more flowers that were tucked away. Now it's getting later in the day. <clears throat> so the sun, it, people who go and take pictures of the desert flowers usually do it around dawn and around um, dusk because of the light. During the middle of the day, it's so intense. It, turns, it tends to burn everything out. Those are primroses. And I'm pretty sure these are pentamens. You can find these in gardening catalogs, but once again, I've tried to grow them and they just aren't happy in the humid east. You can raise the soil, give them good drainage, but they're contending with this humid air, which they do not like. So until the breeders can figure that out, I would leave it to the Western gardeners. And finally, organ pipe cactus, which if you go to Southern Arizona, there's a whole, I mean, it's like 50 miles by 50 miles, I think, right on the border with Mexico, uh, organ pipe state park, I think it is. And these are more common down there and down into Mexico. And I think that is my last one. Yes, it is. So Debbie, questions, comments? I don't know what time it is. What time is it? It's close to quarter of, I think. Okay. Well, if we had a horde of people, <laughs> we would have questions, but see the path there again, lined with stones. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, these plants, since they grow so slowly, do they live a lot longer? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know. I know, okay, um, up near Tucson, they have two parks that have to do with the um, Cerguero, I believe, cactus. One to the east of Tucson and one to the west. And I went to one and it had a, you could drive 13 miles through the park on a two lane road. And I read some research there. Those cactus, and I'm guessing it's true of many of them, maybe not, the prickly pear is pretty hardy. They can withstand a freeze, maybe down to 27 for a few days. But if it's colder than that or longer than that, they don't really survive that well. Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention, and this is in the Phoenix area, but I suspect maybe Tucson as well. They actually have a division in the city police of Phoenix called the Cactus Police. 
And what has happened in the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, all those people moving west and settling in places like Phoenix, and they want to landscape their garden. Well, you can imagine if a cactus takes so long to grow to size, how expensive it would be for a nursery to provide you with, say, a three foot tall cactus. So what do you do? You go out oh. to the desert and you steal one. Oh. And so they were really having a problem with that. And so they actually, I don't know if they still have it, but 10, 20 years ago, there was a, a, a small division in the city police that dealt with that. I mean, people would come up with semi trucks and a crew at night, hop out, and because these are very shallow rooted. So you can easily dig up a three foot cactus and haul them off and then sell them, you know, and make good money mm -hmm. so i you know um i suspect because of the conditions the plants are slow growing and trees here in the northeast if they're slow growing like oaks tend to live longer mm -hmm. than um the quaking aspens that grow quickly so probably that's true but i'm not sure uh, so I can imagine erosion would be a real issue if you started digging up all the plant life. It wouldn't get well, into the hole Well, okay, in that park or outside of Tucson that I drove through, um, until fairly recently, and once again, I don't remember if it was the last 20 or 30 years when it became a park, it was, it was, a, it was a ranch, and they grazed cattle on it. <laughs> so clump 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 all the and once again people are greedy so you don't just put out one cow per 20 acres you put out 10 cows per 20 acres and not only does it eat up a lot of stuff but it wrecks the soil um surface and so the wind comes along and blows away what little bit of dirt there is mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah I, just, I think that's how edges of grasslands ultimately become desert yep and worn so and eaten down and a lot well, of the four wheelers and ATVs they're having problems with too. Yes. There's actually not far from this park, and I've driven past it a few times, an ATV park there in the in the desert, and it's nothing but sand. But they've whatever it is, five square miles, you know, near the Salton Sea. And they've just okay, this is for the ATV guys to roar around and Make it yeah, all so that, a sand desert. So well, I always have an interesting tale to tell if people, you know, if only people would know. If you went back 120 years to northern Arizona, to what is called the Strip, that narrow, it's about maybe 40 miles north to south and about 100 east to west, north of the Grand Canyon and underneath the, um, what would it be, the Utah border, Utah and Nevada maybe. That was high desert grasslands 120 years ago. Grass, grass, not desert. And around 1900 is when the Anglo ranchers moved into the area. And what do they do? Way too many cattle. And within less than a generation, within 20 years, I think, they had overgrazed the soil, the little soil that was there blew away. And now it's a pebbly desert. You cannot go back. Well, if you were a billionaire and owned 10 acres, you could go back. But for 100 miles by 40 miles, gravelly desert, no, you're not going to rehabilitate that. And so because we're uh, stupid and greedy and short-sighted, we ruin things for the future. And I, it just when I think about it, I get really, really annoyed. And of course, that's what we do with the grasslands. And of course, the, the, the dust bowl was a result of that. But do we learn? Not easily. <laughs> so anyway. I think a lot of this vegetation, I know that the um, prickly pear cactus is food for foraging animals like the javelinas, the wild mm -hmm. pigs. And they eat them. Yeah. You, often, you often see the pads with big white marks out of them. Yes. Well, it's rare to find uh, also the cactus wren, 
You know, it's mm -hmm. rare to find a cactus that is quote beautiful in that it's not marred. Also, they're the idiots that go and shoot them up. You know, <laughs> but other than, you know, oh, like our stop signs, right? Target practice. Um, but yeah, you, well, they all evolve together, and the way our world works is you eat something to, to stay alive. So, yes. I think one interesting thing was, let me think now, this is in New Mexico, and you've heard of the Turquoise Trail, where it's a series of um, mostly partly native Pueblos, but also white people that are in the jewelry business. And there's a trail of villages, so let me think, south and east of Albuquerque, where if you're interested in turquoise, you know, you can stop at the shops. But somebody else has started, uh, what is it called? It's for the bats. A certain type of Cerrogero plant, I can't pronounce it, sorry guys. They need a certain kind of bat to pollinate. And so they've got this trail where they're encouraging the bats so that mm -hmm. the cactus continue to live because without one, you're not gonna have the other either. If human beings could learn that, um, we're not going to have it either if we don't take care of it. I mean, we're not, it's not just that we're going to lose the monarchs or lose the Mexican, whatever it is, bats, or our little brown bat. Um, we'll eventually go also because we can't live by ourselves as an island on this planet. And I think the desert, because it's in a sense so harsh and it's not barren, but it seems barren, it's right in your face. It's harder to see that in the jungle or in our deciduous woods here in the Northeast. Well, I'm sort of talked out, Debbie, unless you have more questions. No, very nice job, thank you. Okay, well, it's turned out to be a sunny but cold day today. I hear tell it's going down below zero tonight. Thank goodness we have a snow cover. So, all right. I don't know how to turn this thing off. <laughs> Melanie? I don't hear anybody in the library. Bye. Bye, Mary Lou. See you. All done. Isn't that a great shot of an organ pipe? Yeah.